greetings from the drive-in. We had 110 today in person, eight dogs, so that's exciting. Uh, no cats, so that's okay. Um, please uh, read today's scripture reading with me, and if you can, uh, if you can see it, we're going to try to read it out loud. Do you have that first verse up, Jerry? You might have to clear the background. You know how to do that? Top left-hand corner, it says uh, X out, and it says BKGS. On pro? It's okay. I will read it for us. No worries. This is Romans 12, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance to your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we today started in Romans chapter 12. But oftentimes as we read scripture and as we hear sermons, we get the scripture out of its context. We get the scripture out of how it's supposed to be heard. You see, the church in Rome, which which received this letter from Paul, would have never, ever thought of starting at this spot. It just wouldn't have been a selection type process. See, they would have read this letter from Paul out loud by candlelight in a crowded room as people learn from their teacher, Paul. And as they, as they heard this, as they listened to it, they would have, they'd have heard uh, what we call chapters 1 through 11 immediately prior to this. So then when they hear this word, therefore, it would trigger a change in the conversation. I had a pastor once that said, the word therefore is there so we can ask, huh, what is that there for? Why is there a change here? And the change we're seeing here from from chapters 1 through 11 to chapter 12 is Paul has been saying, hey, this is what you should do. This is what um, you should believe. This is why you should believe it. And then in chapter 12, we're switching to, and this is how you're going to do it. One of the commentaries I read this week in prepping for this sermon said this, Doctrine is never taught in the Bible simply that it may be known. It is taught in order that it may be translated into practice. Before the therefore, we have an explanation of how great God is and how, how magnificent he is and how awesome he is and all these things he's done. And this is now our response. This is what we're supposed to do with it now. And Paul says, in view of God's mercy. I just want you to remember for a second. Remember the mercy that God showed you. Remember when you came to Christ and the sins that God forgave. The fact that he sent his only son, Jesus, to die for us on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. Remember all that awesomeness and love that God showed. Well, in view of that, you have to do something about it. We have to do something about it. And this is that application piece. And Paul says, offer your body as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Now this idea of a a living sacrifice is kind of hard for us to understand because we don't get the whole sacrificial system. But the church in Rome would have understood this really easily. You see, there's temples in Rome like we have McDonald's now, right? So you can go over to Aphrodite's temple and purchase a pheasant for $5.99. And they would go and sacrifice that to Aphrodite for you. And you've done your sacrifice for the day. Aphrodite is pleased. Even the Jewish temple, you could have come with money and bought you a a Big Mac's meal, essentially, and given that to God as a way to show your love and reverence for what God has done for you. So the sacrificial system is there, but in the new covenant, the new way Christ wants us to interact with God, we no longer sacrifice the lives of other creatures. 
We sacrifice our own life. No one else gets to fit the bill anymore because Christ already fit the bill. And now what we have to do is sacrifice our own lives, but not in death. There's a lot of people who say, I will die for Christ. Well, that's the easy part. Living is harder. It's a living sacrifice. Living every day as if you were bound like the sacrifices of the temple in Jerusalem for one purpose, and that is to please God. But with your life. And not just a normal life, a life that is holy and pleasing to God. Now, we don't use this term holy a lot anymore because there's a lot of negative connotations, right? We had this idea of the holy rollers or the people that are holier than now that somehow God has taught us that we should look at God so we can look down at other people. So the term holy has been co-opted by culture as a dirty word for Christians. But in truth, the word holy is so much different. The word holy means set apart. Set apart. You have been chosen. You've been set apart. You are something different. You see, these bodies we have, these vehicles that we, we operate through our daily lives, they have been vehicles of sin for so long. And when Christ comes in and changes that vehicle's no longer for sin, instead of a vehicle for God. You just became a fleet vehicle and didn't even know it. You're for work purposes only. That's what it means to be holy, to be set apart. You don't just go and drive that car whenever you want to. It is for work. And you and I, friends, are living sacrifices, holy and pleasing. We are meant for the work of our Father. And what does that mean for us? How do we do that? Well, Paul goes on and says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So don't, don't conform to the patterns of the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But this is really hard for us, right? Because we have to do the hard work of discerning what are the patterns of the world? What is the, the transforming of our mind? What does this look like? Is that person being transformed? Or are, they, are they going through the patterns of the world? How does God use this system we have to constantly ask God every single day to change our minds away from our opinions and towards Christ's revelation, which can only come through God. And because of our vigilance and attempts as a church to try to not conform to the ways of the world, we have uproared a change every chance we can. So when Paul said, no, no, the Gentiles are allowed into the church, there is uproar, madness. When the the church decided to sing hymns and carols instead of just psalms. Well, this is not pleasing to God. When the Protestant church split away from Catholicism, it wasn't because of a call from God. It was their own selfish desires. That's what we were told. When Sandy Patty began to sing in churches, we were told that that was the devil's work. When guitars started on our stage, we were sure that fire was going to rain down from heaven. How dare we destroy this sacred monolith? And then we added drums. And the rapture had to be coming. Because we are so vigilant about trying to not conform to the world, and it's okay to be vigilant, but we try to stop God. And a lot of us have changed our minds on a lot of those things. Our minds have been changed before, especially about church. In music, our minds have been changed. Before, it was you can only sing hymns. Now we have an amazing choir that will eventually be back, and we'll sing special music, and it'll be awesome and amazing. And the bell choir and the, the current worship service, all these things are now aspects of our church that are just there, and we see God moving. But before, we might not have liked that. Or our dress code, the way that churches dress has changed drastically over the past 20 years and even more so the last 10. The fact that I am in jeans right now would have infuriated some of you three years ago or 10 years ago or three seconds ago. <laughs> but the fact that you are here and we're okay because we understand, hey, God can work through jeans as well as he can work through slacks. We're okay with that. We've changed. We're the people we've allowed into church. Before, church was a, a, a symbol of status, a social club. 
oh, you go to that church, you can do networking with other businesses. And now we're saying our open doors are open for anyone. It doesn't matter who you are, where, where are you from, or what you did. God still loves you. We want you here in this church. God has changed our minds. Grace, or praise be to God. You see, we are supposed to be people of the mission. And the mission is really simple, that we're supposed to use every means necessary short of sin to reach a people who need to know the good news of Christ. Anything short of sin, it's on the table so that people may come to know who Jesus is. And you may not realize that, but you've been a part of this process already. So as we come to a break in the sermon, we have a part two coming up. I want you to leave you with this question. When has God changed your mind? When has God changed your mind about something in church in particular? What was a, a stance that five, two, two, five, ten, twenty, thirty years ago that could never, ever be allowed? That now you recognize, I was wrong. God changed it. Let's ponder that as we sing our call to prayer. So I left you with the question, when has God changed your mind? And I want you to really think about that. That wasn't a, a throwaway. I'm going to come back to that now. Did God reason with you? In your prayer time, in your time of reading, did God show you a, a series of, of answers to questions you had? And you're like, well, that makes sense. Or did God transform your mind? Did God just flip a switch in you? It wasn't an experience shift. Were you able to just think more critically as you grew older? What was it that changed in you? Maybe God's good and pleasing and perfect love made you realize that another time, another place was not completely satanical. Instead, it was more of a praise song. You see, we as a church, we need to be vigilant about not conforming to the world, but we need to be vigilant in a different way. You see, we don't need to be vigilant in, oh my gosh, what if this could hinder God? Because let's be honest, or honest, nothing can hinder our God. That's not really a concern. Instead, we should be worried about what could hinder other people from hearing the good news of Christ. And anything that could hinder that needs to be removed from our places of worship. Now, how do we do that? And why do we care about that? Well, it's really simple. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance to the faith God has distributed to each of us. This idea that we somehow have a right understanding of God could never truly be true. Even on your best day, with the deepest study, you could never fully understand our God. If you could, you wouldn't be a God worth serving. So let's not judge others. There's enough internal work as it is before we start externally going to other people or other things in our lives. Let's be honest, a lot of us focus on the gardening a lot more than the housework that needs to happen inside. We make sure the grass is cut outside, but the, the inside of our soul and our hearts is a mess. It's all about appearances. And even when it comes to church, we're a lot more lax on what we conform to the world with outside of the two hours that we spend on Sunday morning here in, in church. We have high moral standards for the leadership of the church, which we should. That's important. That's biblical. But the moral standards for the, the people that we watch on television or the movies we watch or the people we idolize in sport, it's a lot lower. And sometimes we even celebrate the lack of moral standard in people that we look up to. Why is the life outside of these walls so eager to conform to the world when we're so afraid of anything that's changed inside? And let's go outside of moral standards. What we, what we consume, the music, the, uh, the television shows, the things that are not pleasing to God in the slightest, we will talk about over lunch with language we would never use here, but instead we get in uproars about the slightest change in our church. We are not living as living sacrifices. Instead, we are bowing down to the altar of history as mourners. 
it, we, what we need to do is we need to take every one of our beliefs and our opinions and our preferences and what we think we know and lay them beside the Scriptures and have the Holy Spirit show us what is the will of God and consistently change to lean more towards Christ. We have been called to be set apart. We have been called to be living sacrifices, people who are willing to do anything short of sin to bring people into the body of Christ, but yet the body of Christ is not fully operating the way we need to. You see, we have this great understanding of this concept, this understanding of the mission, but we're not all directly involved. And it's a lot more than just the staff or the pastors who have to be involved in the mission of Christ. It's all of us. If we read in the scripture, it says, For just as each of you is one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, from one body, and each member belongs to the other. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. And if it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. We all have gifts, but we're not all using them. We are one body, whether you're online or whether you're on site or whether you're on the fence. We are all one body of Christ. One whole. But a lot of us are holding up our end of the bargain. A lot of us have gifts that we're not using. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, step up. With all these different gifts, we, we could be the body of Christ that God has called us to be. But we need you. If you imagine, there is a, uh, a, a Lego masterpiece collection of the Death Star. This massive destruction force in Lego world, right? It's one of the largest Lego pieces in the world. But if you are missing half the pieces, it doesn't look much like a Death Star. It doesn't have the same operational capacity, so to speak. Well, friend, some of you are the long four-piece Legos, and some of us are the small two-piece Legos, and some of us are the really weird round Legos that are all required for us to be who Christ has called us to be. So let's say that you have the gift of prophesying, and that does not mean you're listening to voices, so we're on the same page. <laughs> prophesying is not that you go into trances and that kind of stuff. A prophet in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, honestly, is someone who hears God saying, turn back to me through the scriptures, and someone who speaks that truth into the church. We need prophets right now in the church, in our church and in every church, that are willing to say we need to turn back to God. Not to this, not to that. Focus on the Son of Man, on what Christ has done for us. We need prophets, and the church is suffering because we don't have prophets anymore. We need servants, not volunteers. Volunteers give of their time at their convenience. Servants serve at the direction of the Holy Spirit. Servants serve in areas they don't really like, in places people don't see. Servants are willing to step into the gap and say, where do you need me, God? Here I am, Lord, send me. And then they actually go. And we need servants. And the body of Christ is suffering without them. Teachers, people who are able to communicate the truth of the scriptures to people so they understand and can go into a deeper relationship with God, we need them now. We need teachers for adventures in faith and friendship connection. If, by the grace of God, Meadowlawn Elementary School and every family that's associated with it decided we're going to come to church, we would be overrun because my wife currently sits down there as the only teacher this Sunday. But yet there are teachers in our midst who are not operating within their gifts for the glory of God. We need teachers. If we want to actually teach the next generation how to love God, we need people who can teach. 
and the church is suffering because of it. We need encouragers. I need an encourager. I can tell you that. Your pastors and your staff, the parents here who are having to make hard call for their children, the teachers at the school and the administrators who are having to, to make monumental decisions with very little grace need encouragers and people to say, you're okay, you're doing it, you're going to make it, it's going to be okay. Not people who are keyboard warriors on Facebook, who have a lot of opinions and not a lot of sense. We need actual encouragers who are willing to say, I don't care what my opinion is, Jesus loves you. We need givers, people who are able to financially give for the ministries of the church, that way the the kingdom of God may come on earth as it is in heaven. If that's you, we need you to give. We need leaders. You know what you need in a time when it's never like it has been before? Anybody else really wish we had some precedent at times again? Instead of unprecedented times? I need some precedent at times. Sometimes that I'm used to. Sometimes that are normal. That's not coming anytime soon. And when that happens, you need leaders. And we have Leaders. We have those pieces in our congregation right now who are not stepping up. And we need you. And the church is suffering without you. We need mercy. People who can say, it's okay, it turns out you're actually human. And even with all your failures and mistakes, God still loves you and so do I. So that way it's not just God loves you, but there's another person in this world who loves you just the same. We need people of mercy who can stand at those doors. When people come in, they say, welcome to a place that you are loved. And before someone can say, but I, but God. Could you imagine being a part of a body of Christ like this? Where we are growing closer to one another. Where people are telling us we need to come back to God. And we listen where servants are serving throughout the entirety of the church in places that we don't even know about because they've been called in the mercy, in view of the mercy of God, to serve. Teachers who are able to communicate with our kids the good news of Christ. That way when they grow old, they do not deter and go away from it. Or connect groups where adults can come back to the beginning and the basics and learn what they've missed because people who accept Christ later in life have no true direction on how they should grow as a disciple. Encouragers. Could you imagine if no one from our church said a negative thing on Facebook for a month? Wow. Didn't share a meme. But instead, in every one of their friends' posts, they said, that's amazing, God still loves you. Could you imagine if we were giving as if God was going to bless us more. If we were leading and being led by leaders who understand that we can risk it for the biscuit, that anything short of sin is on the table if we can bring the love of God to a people in need. Could you imagine if we were a church known for its mercy? Not because of who we are, but because of who he is and what he's done. But the missing piece is not some mythical creature. It's you. We don't need to hire anybody. It's you. We don't need anybody else. God's provided. It's just you and I have to say yes and continuously say yes, a long obedience to the cause. We have to make willing sacrifices of our insecurities, of our schedules and free time, of our success, offer them as living sacrifices to God and say, look, this is what I'm offering you. Take it and do what you need to do with it and watch God work. So friends, we have to make a decision. Will we live as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, so that the church can be the church and the kingdom of God may come on earth as it is in heaven? In full view of the mercy of God, will we act like It's just not that important. Let's pray. Father God, your word is true, and we thank you for it because your word has done nothing but challenge. Since you spoke it and since it was written, God, the scriptures have always called us back to you and back to a better and stronger and harder way of living that can bring glory to you. 
So God, give us the strength to be your people so that the world may know who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.